Continuing with Thomas Hobbes' metaphysics. So as I mentioned before, Hobbes embraces metaphysical determinism. And this was his reasoning. If the physics of Hobbes' time provided the last word on nature, this would seem to entail that the world is deterministic, because the physics of his time were deterministic. So what is determinism in this sense? Well, it's a view that future events are determined of necessity by past events. That is to say, if you have event A, that of necessity leads to event B, which leads to event C, D, etc. Roughly put, things you know, cannot be otherwise, given sort of that initial starting condition. And so the idea is, is that there essentially is not a random chance, nor is there metaphysical free will. So what about the uncertainty we experience, where we don't know the future? Or what about unpredictability? To use, you know, kind of a classic example, think of, um, you know, gambling or just simply rolling dice. We think of those as being, you know, random, that they seem to be uncertain and unpredictable, and you can't say for sure, like, what number is going to come up, unless, of course, the dice are rigged. Or other events. Think of, like, sporting events, it, predicting who's going to win. And if you're trying to, you know, predict, you know, complicated events, you know, laying aside just predicting who's going to win, imagine trying to, pre you know, predict the entire events of a, of a game, you know, a football game, basketball game, etc. So how does Hobbes account for that? And what he says is this. Uncertainty and unpredictability are not features of the world in the sense of it being, you know, metaphysically unpredictable, metaphysically uncertain. Rather, it is a feature of our knowledge, or more appropriately, our lack of knowledge. So if we take the example of dice, it seems like they're random. You, know, you roll a die, and it seems like it generates a random number, say, between 1 and 6, or 1 and 20 whatever die you're rolling. And we think of that as being random. But according to Hobbes, when we think an event results from chance, like the roll of dice, this is due to our ignorance of the causes. So we don't know the outcome, so we think it results from chance. But according to Hobbes, we are wrong about this. So he embraces metaphysical determinism. And again, two important implications of this, entailments, are that if determinism is true, then there is no random chance in the world. Also, of course, there would be no free will. Whatever happens, happens because it must happen. Now, what about us, humans? Well, I've already mentioned, you know, no free will, so that's kind of a spoiler. But looking at human behavior. Now, as we saw with Hobbes, one of his innovations, uh, one of his views, is that we humans are governed by physical law. We're not exempt from them. So according to him, it would follow that our behavior is also determined. So we don't get like a special metaphysical carve out that provides us with, you know, this freedom of the will. So it seems to us that we're, you know, unpredictable and perhaps even free basically because our science is not that good. Now, he holds, because he believes we're determined, that the more we understand the laws that govern our behavior, the more predictable our behavior will be. Now, we may never be able to achieve, you know, perfect predictions, because we'll always presumably have imperfect knowledge, but the idea is, is that the more we understand, you know, the laws governing us, the more accurate our predictions will be. And to some extent, if we want to look at this, you know, sort of practically, we have through statistical analysis of behavior, in a large part because of things like insurance, you know, figure out when insurance companies, you know, they want to figure out, you know, how likely people are to die, how likely people are to get in automobile accidents. And currently, of course, they can't predict, you know, if you or I will get in an accident, you know, and say like, okay, uh, you know, three days from now, you'll get into a car crash. But what they can do is they can predict in general in a typical year, 
how many people will get into accidents uh, because of the analysis of the stats. And so that his you know, notion that we can predict human behavior is get, getting more plausible. And of course, we can also look at it in terms of you know companies like Facebook and Google, which try to predict our behavior with algorithms. They're trying to you know predict what you how you behave, etc. And so we can see like the whole advertising uh, mechanisms, etc. Behind these companies, they're you know working on this notion that our behavior is predictable by these algorithms. So then, how does he explain our seeming ability to engage in making decisions, engaging in intentional actions? Well, what he does is draws a distinction between what he calls vital emotions and voluntary emotions. So the vital emotions are what we call automatic activities, things that occur without, you know, clearly without any conscious choice. We don't have to, you know, think about them. You know, clear examples would be like digestion. When you eat, you don't have to remind yourself, you know, after having some pizza, you don't have to say, okay, remember to digest pizza, because uh, you don't have to consciously do that. Or similarly, the circulation of the blood. You don't have to remember, okay, heart, you know, keep keep pumping that blood. Uh, or, you know, breathing. We don't have to, you know, remember to, to breathe. It just will, you know, when we start getting um, low on oxygen, we just kind of breathe automatically. And those, if you, you know, say to someone, hey, you know, your digestion your blood circulation, your liver, you know, detoxifying, etc., your kidneys filtering. If you say to someone, yeah, those are all, de- you know, determined by bodily states, those are all, all purely mechanistic, pretty much everyone would say, yeah, that makes sense. I don't have to, you know, I don't choose my digestion. I don't have to consciously will that my blood circulate. But when it comes to deliberation, uh, for example, if there's an election coming up, and a person is trying to choose between two candidates, or they're at a you know restaurant looking at the the menu, trying to decide between say the burrito versus say the pizza versus the hamburger. It seems like they're deliberating. So how does he explain this deliberation? So Hobbes needs to provide an account that reconciles our deliberation and his view of determinism. Uh, to give two examples uh, one might be like a food case imagine a person is uh, you know, at a restaurant and they're trying to seemingly deliberate and decide between the pizza or the burrito or you can imagine a person they might feel an inclination to make a commitment in a relationship yet also feel reservations that they might want to stay single so how does Hobbes account for those well, he explains our deliberation in terms of either experiencing alternating feelings of desire and aversion, or there's this motion between competing desires or two conflicting aversions. So, in the first case, uh, you can go with the you know person selecting the relationship. They might have desire. To commit to the relationship, but then also have an aversion to tying themselves, you know, to one person, giving up, you know, uh, freedom to do as they as they want, etc. In the case of you know picking, you know, between food, they might have competing desires that they they want, you know, the pizza, but they also want the burrito, and they're thinking about perhaps the guacamole, or they might have two conflicting aversions. Maybe they're at the restaurant and it's not, you know, do I want, do I crave the pizza more, the burrito more, but it may be that they dislike pizza and they dislike burrito, but those are the only options. It's, you know, the restaurant of pizza or burrito. And so they dislike both and this is their only option. So if they decide which one they dislike, or it can be again, competing desires, they want both. So how does this get sorted out according to Hobbes? Well, our, you know, our sort of our common sense intuitive view is that a person makes a decision, perhaps using their free will. But according to Hobbes, 
this deliberation is determinate. So why then does it seem like we have this, this struggle? Well, for him, it, in a way, literally, it is a struggle. He explains it in terms of a competition between forces. And it's a case in which, like all competitions, typically, the strongest wins. So that final motion where we think we make our decision, we think we engage our will, we see it as an act of will. I choose the pizza or I choose to be in the relationship or the alternative. You know, you choose the burrito or you choose, you know, to see other people. So it feels like an act of will. But according to Hobbes, it's no more free than any other physical motion. So, you know, if you have, um, you know, physical objects, you know, you see like a, say like something sliding along on the ice, you know, kind of veering one way and the other. We don't think that the thing sliding like a hockey puck, for example, is, is willing when it's sliding back and forth. It just goes whichever, you know, you know, force is stronger. And, or like if you have uh, the waves, you know, pulling at a you know, log stuck in the, the sand, we don't think that the sand or the log are willing, you know, to resist the pull of the tide. It's just whichever is stronger. Will Is the log embedded deep enough that the tide, the water cannot pull it out? Or will the tide prove stronger? But there's no willing or deciding. It's just whichever stronger wins, according to Hobbes. So our seeming deliberation and will is the result of our ignorance. And if we knew how this all worked, according to Hobbes, we would realize that it's all deterministic and there really is no choice. There really is no chance. Or so he claims. Now, of course, there's all kinds of irony with, you know, trying to convince people to accept an account in which there is no free will because either they are determined to accept it or determined to reject it. But of course, you know, Hobbes could say, well, he's determined to make his case. He can't do otherwise. So that takes the end of our good dead friend, Thomas Hobbes, in his metaphysics, which also figures prominently in his political philosophy, which of course is a subject for another uh, actual course. So stay safe and I'll see you in the future. <laughs>